as far as the subject today goes, I wanted to talk about how as believers, every single person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, has a sense of belonging, right? Everything is in a state of fana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kulluman alayha fan. So everyone has something that they feel like they're part of. And sometimes it could be a job that we're part of, a company that you're part of, or a cause that you, you take a part in it, or, or a community. So we belong to something and uh, we become an integral part of it. And the reality is the Prophet Sallallahu in his vision of uh, the believer, in, in his vision of the relationship between a believer and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in every moment, in every state of his life, he was in a state of witnessing Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's reality in whatever was presented before him, whether it's, uh, whether it's something that is insignificant or something mighty. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was always in a state of witnessing Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's creative power, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's wisdom, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala doing things and moving things and, and the, the, the very intricate and intimate details of how Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala was, was, was developing the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was always in a state of witnessing. And sometimes the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was hopeful because he felt, you know, this revelation is coming to him. This message is coming to him. He's going to go and invite the people and they're going to accept, especially when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, Ya Rasul, Ya Muhammad, go and invite your people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was full of hope. And, and he, was, he was adamant to go and, and call the people. And he thought that he's going to invite them to Allah. They're going to see the message. They're going to be very clear. And they're going to love Allah and they're going to come accept Islam. So he came to the mountain sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he started calling the people. And he started calling with the emergency call, you know. Uh, they didn't have a 911 dial at that time. But the Prophet Sallallahu in his time, they had a, a call by which you could call the tribes. And they knew this is an emergency. So they would come. Rasulullah Sallallahu got on the mountain and he shouted. Wa sabaha, wa sabaha, wa banu hashima, wa banu kalba. And he started calling them one by one by one. And they gathered and they came. And... Up until this point, they know who's Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They know he's trustworthy. They know he's he's a, a person of integrity. They know he's a person of dignity. So they all gathered and they're waiting for the announcement. What is this gathering about? And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he asked them just to to verify what he thought, what you know they think of him. He said, "If I told you there's an army behind this mountain ready to attack you in the morning, are you going to believe me?" They said, "Yes, we believe you." Now, these are his people. They, like he, he grew up with them. He saw them you know, going to the marketplace. They, they, they played ball together when they were little. You know? these, are, these are his people. So his uncle is there. His, his relatives are there. His distant cousins are there. So he said, you know, if, if I told you there's an army, will you believe me? They said, yes, we believe you. Somebody shouted in the back, we never heard you lie before. Somebody else said, yes, we call you Sadiq and Amin. Right? So th this is like a, a clear sign. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he find comfort in his heart. He said, then I have a greater message for you. The day of meeting with Allah is coming. The day of meeting with Allah is coming. So prepare for that meeting. Now, if somebody tells you this, and you know, this is, this is for us, it's obvious. Like we're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we're, we're doing everything we're doing. That's why you pray. That's why you fast. That's why you're, you're doing everything that you do so you can be prepared for that meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, the day of meeting with Allah is coming, his own uncle, he said, Tabbalak, jama'atana, like may you be cursed. Is this why you gathered us? And he walked away. Right? His uncle walked away. This is his uncle. And when his uncle walked away, Everybody else started laughing and then they started walking away. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he had so much hope. He thought things would go one way. He had this image in his mind. Everybody will come and accept Islam. But suddenly he's now faced with the reality. No. The reality is something else. People will reject this message. People will turn their back to this message. And people will give you a hard time. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in that, in that stage in his mission, he was heartbroken, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he was in a state of deep, deep sadness because not only was he like betrayed by his own family members, but but he was like, he was so like, he came to them with love and hope, 
and they, they, they rejected him and they turned their backs to him. And the Prophet وسلم, he was patient with them. And they were, you know, they, they, they started to increase in their animosity. They start to increase in their hostility. They start to persecute Muslims. They start to torture Muslims. Like if you know the, the, the level of hardship that the Sahaba they went through for this religion to reach us, you would say, man, like they, they would get themselves killed, but they wouldn't give up Islam. But today, like, you know, we, we take it for granted because it came to us easy. But, you know, the Prophet وسلم, he witnessed all these hardships and all these difficulties. And in, in the depths of these darknesses, he could see that this is all by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is all by the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making this happen for a reason. Somebody came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you make dua for us? He came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, why don't you make dua for us? And, and you know, they told him, what made you say this to the Prophet sallallahu He said, we were being tortured and we were being persecuted. And they said, they, they took me down, they tied me and they put burning charcoals on my back. Right? And, and they're like, it can't be that bad. So he lifted up his shirt and he showed it to the tabi'in. They saw like literally holes on his back that, that the, the, the Quraysh was doing to them. And he came to the Prophet and said, why don't you make dua for us? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, you people are in a state of rush. You're in a hurry. You want your Jannah right now. Right? You should be patient and, and, and let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do his thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you in this life, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask you certain things. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you to do certain things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wants his wisdom to be known. So a Muslim who's a sinner, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might manifest his mercy upon him. And so that at the end of his life, he finds out Allah is forgiving. A Muslim who's going through hardships, he might find out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brings ease. A Muslim who's sick will find out who's going through hardships and sickness, that Allah is the healer. So whatever situation you're in, there is a, there is a next stage. You're not going to stay in the way you are forever, right? Life is not stuck here now. Time is moving and everything is going to pass and you're on a journey to Allah. And so when you're on this journey, just, you know, submit yourself and go where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to take you. And so when we get rushed and we start getting hasty, what starts to happen is somebody says, you know, I did so much good deeds. I worship Allah for so many years. And I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. And then he says, and then I got this hardship and that hardship. And then I got this difficulty and that difficulty. And my, you know, somebody I love died. Why did God do this to me? And so I'm done with this. Did they get hasty or no? This is the very definition of them getting hasty. The Prophet wasallam told us that when you live a good life, right? No matter what your life circumstances, when, when you exit this world and you end up in the Akhirah, and, and our reward is in the Akhira. The Prophet Sallallahu told us, for a believer, for every thorn that pricked their foot, for every hardship they went through, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will reward them. For every dua that they made that was not accepted, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will compensate for them. For every difficulty they went through, for every loss, for every fear, for every sadness, for every, every tear, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will reward them. Right? And, and only Allah knows what you're going through. Only Allah knows what you have been through. And only Allah knows how strong you have to be in order to not fall into the fitna and the trial and the tribulations that everyone else around you seems to be falling into. Like it takes a certain type of courage and determination to hold on to Islam. And it takes a lot of courage to hold on to Iman when everybody around you has no idea about what's halal and haram. And they're going after every shiny thing. And you say, no, I, I don't want to follow something that is not in according to the to the prophetic way this takes a level of courage and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you're doing and he knows what you're going through right and, and you see people around you for example you have friends you have people you know and and this sad reality about people is as we change right and it also could be a good thing we change and sometimes you see people change for the worse sometimes you see you see people that you used to trust, that you used to love, that you used to depend on, and then you find that they start making foolish decisions. They find themselves in a company of uh, people that are that are that are away and misguided. And so, you know, if you're if you're in a company, for example, you you're a strong Muslim, you're a believer, 
right? And then it's not to say it's not, it can't happen to us. May Allah protect us. You're a strong Muslim. You're in a bad company. They invite you to go out drink. First day you say, no, I don't, I don't drink. Second day you might say, I don't drink. Six months later, one year later, two years later, eventually what happens? Right? If, 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 if we're exposed to the, to the things constant, uh, continuously and consistently, eventually our guard gets worn down. And so you see people that used to be strong believers and then suddenly something happens, they get exposed to certain friends or certain environment or certain conditions and then their iman starts to waver. And then they, they, they're challenged and tested. And then you see them failing the tests. Now you're looking at them and you may think, oh, this person is messing up. The Prophet ﷺ taught us to look at them and make dua. Ya Allah, have mercy on them. Ya Allah, have mercy on them and forgive them and guide them to the straight path. Because every moment there is a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being manifested upon you. And one of the names of Allah is Al-Hadi. Another name is Al-Mudil. The one who guides and the one who misguides. The one who gives light and the one who leaves in the darkness. The one who gives life and the one who causes death. Right? And the Prophet Sallallahu he told us to be in a state of worship of Allah as if you see him. So in whatever situation you see, in whatever person you see, in whatever family you see, if you see them struggling, you see them going through hardship, remember that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is bringing that to you so that you can make dua for them. And the Prophet Sallallahu told us the dua of a believer to his brother is accepted. The dua of a believer to his brother is accepted. Now, when we see these things, when Allah tests us, we have a reaction, right? You can have a sadness, you can have depression, you can have all these different feelings. Uh, and, and you can react by saying, Ya Allah, why are you doing this to me? And this is, uh, this is something the Prophet Sallallahu he prohibited us from saying, even though he himself went through the greatest hardship, he saw his children die in front of him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He buried them and he was crying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And somebody said, Ya Rasulullah, even you cry. He said, we cry, but we don't say anything except what is pleasing to Allah, right? And then when he would see others, he would make dua for them. Uh, the worst of people, hypocrites that hurt Islam, that hurt the Prophet Sallallahu that betrayed Muslims from within, they committed crimes that you and I cannot imagine. When one of them died, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi came and started making dua for him, start asking Allah for forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so much that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Oh my Nabi, these people, they hurt you. I will not forgive them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa kept on insisting and making dua for them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was told in the Quran, even if you ask Allah to forgive them 70 times, I will not forgive them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, then I will ask Allah to forgive them more than 70 times. Right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa this was his message. This is his method. This is his, his method. Like he was mercy, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And he brought this religion as mercy. So even in your heart, in your hardship, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam recognized this is mercy. And when you see others going through hardship, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would show mercy. And when you see, when what's a greater hardship than somebody suffering in their deen? Right? If you see somebody like hurt, their legs broken, that's an outward physical pain. Alhamdulillah, it will pass. But somebody who's struggling in their deen, they, 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 they refuse to pray, they refuse to fast, they, they dress inappropriately, they, they do drugs, they do these things, they have a sickness, right? And this sickness is worse than the physical sickness. And so don't they need dua more than they need criticism? Don't they need dua more than they need judgment? Right? And we're quick to judge, right? <laughs> we're very quick to judge. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, this is the reality, that we didn't create you in this world except to worship Allah. And to worship Allah means to recognize and to know Allah. And whenever some one of the creation of Allah comes in front of you, you have to recognize their affair is in the hands of Allah. Their affair is in the hands of Allah. The moment you put yourself in the position of saying this person is good or bad, then it becomes backbiting. It becomes something that is disliked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he was talking about backbiting, he said the sin of it is like eating the flesh of your dead brother. And they said, what if it's true, Ya Rasulullah? He said, if it's true, it's backbiting. But if it's not true, it's worse than that. It's something else called buhtan. And buhtan is a false accusation. And that, that, that's another level. We ask Allah for protection. So 
What I'm trying to say is, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, when you find that you're in a straight path, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected you, you have to have gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just gratitude, that's it. And you can't look left and right and say, oh, I'm better than these people. Because it could have been that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would put us in that situation. It's possible, right? Uh, there, is a, there is a person who said he was held back from praying tahajjud for six months. He was a big, big wali of Allah. He said for six months, he said he couldn't get up for to pray tahajjud because one time he saw a person praying in the masjid and he was crying. The person was crying. And he said, he just thought in his heart, is this person really sincerely crying for Allah or is he putting on a show? He just thought that and, and that's it. He wasn't able to get up for tahajjud starting the next day. They said, I was withheld from tahajjud for six months because of this. So imagine, and this is of course, awliya are at the higher level. They, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to, you know, hold them to a different standard than, than the average people like you and me. So if you, if you cannot avoid having ill thoughts about people, at least try to speak good about them. And if you cannot do that, then make dua for them. All right? But if you can't do anything, then just remain silent. Leave their affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And know, and know, and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to guide the worst of people. They used to say that, we, that you know, Sahaba said, we used to believe the donkey of Omar would become Muslim before Omar. Because Omar radiallahu anhu was so like tough against Muslims. He was torturing Muslims. They said, his donkey is going to become Muslim before that guy. That guy, no way. And Omar radiallahu anhu, one day, he's out. He wants to kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Like, look at the level, right? He took his sword. He put it around his neck. He said, I'm going to put an end to this Islam thing. And he walked out looking for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And one Sahabi saw him. And he saw the look in his eyes. He said, man, Omar is out for blood. He said, Omar, where are you going? He said, I'm going to go kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Right? And he said, whoa, before you do that, why don't you deal with your family first? Your sister, I think she's following him. And he said, what? My sister? He said, yeah, yeah. And, and then as soon as he turned around, went to the sister's house, the sahabi ran to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Omar is coming. Omar radiallahu goes to the sister's house and somebody's there teaching her Quran. He knocks on the door. Her husband jumps out of the window, runs away. This guy hides under the, 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 the table and she opens the door and she sees Omar is fuming with anger. He says, what was that sound I just heard? She said, it, it's nothing, right? And then like she, he finds the Quran there. He says, is this it? He says, she says, don't touch it. You know, you, 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 you need to make wudu. And, and back and forth, he gets angry. He slaps her. And she falls on the ground, bleeding her, from her face. And then he feels remorse. He's like, man, I messed up, right? So he's trying to comfort his sister. She's like, don't touch me, you know? And then finally, he's like, okay, fine. Let me read it. She goes, go make wudu. He goes and he makes wudu. And then she gives him the Quran. He starts reading the Quran. And the Quran touches his heart. To the point, he says, is this what Quraysh is running from? Is this what they're running from? So he says, I'm going to go and accept Islam. And he goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now the, the alarm is up, right? The, everybody's on high high alert. Omar is coming with a sword. He wants to kill the Prophet. And, and Omar knocks on the door of Dar al-Arqam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, Hamza radiallahu stands up. He says, let me go deal with him. So he says, sit down, Hamza. I'm going to deal with him myself. Sallallahu alayhi wa He had the strength of 100 men. Sallallahu alayhi wa So he goes and he opens the door and he just grabs Omar. He says, when are you going to accept ya Omar? And Omar just falls down. He says, I accept ya Rasulullah. And then Omar became Muslim, right? And they said his donkey was going to become Muslim before him. What about people here? What about, you know, the, the Muslims that are, that are, that are, they don't know their religion yet. Or if they know, they're, they're, they're still like, the, the lure of the dunya is very strong. Now we have to understand that. We're living in a time where there is shay shayateen actively working, right? If you look at the media, they want you to be confused about whether you're male or female. They want you to be confused about whether there is life after death or not. They want you to be confused about how you should live your life, what is morality, what is this? They want you to be living a life of confusion. And, and, and they, 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 they're okay with that and they're promoting it and they're, they're spending so much money on it. It's in every movie, every TV show and everything, right? So when you see this level of fitna, the Prophet ﷺ said, at the end of time, there will be people 
if they hold on to Islam, it will, one of their good deeds will be like equal to 50. Sahaba said 50 of ours are theirs, Ya Rasulullah. He said 50 of your deeds. So one of your good deeds, if you pray Maghrib today, it's like a Sahabi prayed Maghrib 50 times. Allahu Akbar. Right? You say, Subhanallah, it's like a Sahabi sat the whole day saying, Subhanallah. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies the good because of the level of, of, of corruption that exists in the world today. All the shayateen are out. Before, like if somebody used to drink, a Muslim family, they would hide it, right? They, it was something shameful. They would feel sorry about what they're doing, but they would they would keep their bottles in the hidden and they would drink in the night and, and they would make sure nobody find out. Now it's on Instagram. You want to know what they're drinking? They post it, you know? So so it's 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 there's a glorification of sin that's happening today. And if you're holding on to your Islam in this in this in this time, every good that you do, I swear by Allah, it is worth more than gold. It is worth more than anything under the sun. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is multiplying it. He's multiplying it. He's multiplying it. And so when you come on the day of judgment and you, you're somebody who used to, to 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 protect yourself and hold on to what is sacred, you find what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved up for you and you'll be happy that you missed out on all these other things. You know, you'll be so happy that you say, man, thank God I didn't follow these guys. And in Surah to Safat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, people are brought into Jannah and they start wondering about their friends. What happened to that friend of ours? Oh, the guy used to invite us to the party all the time. I don't know. Let's find out. So they ask Allah to show them. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, a window opens up and they look into Jahannam. Yeah, they're in Jannah. You ask whatever you want, Allah will show you. Right? So they're asking about their friend. Allah shows them their friend. And this guy who was, uh, who was living the life, as you would say, right? He was the, he was the party. Uh, he was the life of the party. And he was the one who was doing all these things. And he used to always question, Are you sure you're on the straight path, man? You, you're doing all this religious stuff. Like, why you got to make life so hard for yourself? Just take it easy. Just drink some, do something, you know, have some fun. This is the guy. Have some fun guy. Right? So, so The window opens up. They see him in the depths of the fire. And then they're like, whoa. Then they said to their friend, by Allah, you almost ruined us, man. You almost dragged us into hell with you. Like we were trying so hard to protect ourselves. And you are the guy who kept coming and offering these things. And you are the guy like, you know, so they, they get mad at him because they thought he was their friend. But he wasn't. He was their enemy. He was their enemy. And, and you have to be careful of your enemies, people that are that come to you as friends, but they, they tell you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're your enemies. They're not your friends. And you have to you have to distinguish between them and and and, and steer clear from them. Unless you have influence over them, then, then invite them to Allah. But if you don't have influence over them, then, then stay away from them. So after this whole episode is finished, the window is closed, they, they, they realize they're in Jannah again. So they look at each other and say, oh, we're in Jannah, we're not going to die. Right? And we're not going to have any punishment. This is the greatest reward. This is it. This is what we're working for. And the reality is the Jannah is only beginning of the journey. Right? We think Jannah is the end goal. Right? Because you're working and, and you die and then you go to this, to this new life and you're in Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Jannah every day is better than the day before. Every moment is better than the moment before. Every time you look at somebody you love, you look away and you look at them again, they're more beautiful than before. And then and, and the, they described in Jannah, there's a, there's a marketplace of forms, right? You can choose different forms. So you can say, I want to look like that today. <laughs> it's, it's you. It's just you take on a different form. So every moment is, is getting better and better and better. And ultimately, the ultimate return is finally to the infinity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it's it's only you're, you're, you're experiencing Allah's mercy at a more intensified rate every single day and there's no end to it. It's infinite. Right? And so nothing is worth infinity. Nothing is worth your, your, your akhirah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and to preserve us and to keep us upon the straight path. Um, we're going to take a short break for Maghrib. I have one question. 
Um, it's that if you're like um, working with other people and your teacher or manager asks you to evaluate others, um, would that count as backbiting? So in a situation like this, uh, it's permissible to to highlight because it's it's a it's a business contract, right? So for example, Omar Radiolan, who he was a he was a Khalifa, Amir al Mu'minin, and he was appointing governors. So these are people in public office, they, they have influence in the lives of others. And so he would actually actively seek out uh, what they're doing. And sometimes he would find things that he didn't like, you know, and he would replace them. Um, so in those situations, it's permissible to, to actually, uh, you know, find out about the person or to, to say about the person uh, what, what their qualities are. And, um, and that's, that it relates to the business, it relates to the job that you're doing. Uh, it's not considered backbiting as long as you're truthful and you don't exaggerate. Right? Uh, sometimes if you don't like the person, you might exaggerate a little bit. <laughs> that, that's when the problem happens. Um, but uh, there's in occasions of marriage, if somebody wants to get married to somebody and they ask you, you can tell about that person, whatever you know. If somebody wants to do business with somebody and they come and they ask you, you can talk about that person, no problem. Uh, if somebody's running for public office, you know they, they're getting into a position of power where they make decisions, then you can you can talk about that person. And similarly with the 360 evaluation that they do with peer review and all that stuff, you can do that. Any other questions? You know, Mullah Nasruddin, he came to the marketplace and he put a sign. He said, we'll answer any two questions for 100 gold coins. So somebody said, Mullah, 100 gold coins, isn't that too much? He said, yes, what's your second question? <laughs> Don't worry, I won't charge you for your questions. said earlier about how like in general there's like that marketplace with like different forms do you know of like any other things like that i just want to like hear like more about that type of stuff in like general yeah um well there is the general ayat right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that jannah is a place you have whatever you ask for and so like you can let your imagination go with that one but the prophet وسلم, he told us that even whatever you imagine is actually not what, like Jannah is different than that. Because he said Jannah is something no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and no mind can even think about. This is still Allah's creation, right? And then uh, he described to us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, certain things. He said, uh, when, when he visited Jannah, he saw uh, the backyard of Abu Bakr. He said, as far as the eyes could see, it was, it, was, it was Abu Bakr's backyard. And uh, he said there was a tree there that uh, if you were to go around it on a fast horse, it would take you 500 years. So, so, I mean, you can imagine. And then, of course, our ulama, they said, if you want to understand Jannah, uh, the Prophet saw some described, like there, there's woman in Jannah, the Hur al-Ain. He said, they're so beautiful, you can see their bone marrows. Right now, if you want to imagine that, you would imagine somebody who's transparent, you can see their bone marrows. But the, the scholars, they said, no, what's actually happening is uh, the Jannah is, is not like this world. It's like this world is three dimensional, right? So you have, you have six directions. In Jannah, you have more than six directions. And so the way of seeing, the way of perceiving, it's all different. And so if like you could have a hyperdimensional object where you could see inside it and outside of it at the same time. And so they said, like the, the Prophet Sallallahu described the houses of Jannah as being made of pearls. He said, when you're inside, you can see outside of it. And when you're outside, you can see inside of it. Like, so, so there's like, even if you try to imagine it, you can't. But uh, somebody asked, I heard there is wine in Jannah. I'm confused, wine was haram. So, there is wine in Jannah, but the wine of Jannah is not haram. Um, the, the wine of the intoxicants of this world is haram. 
right? But the, in Jannah, the wine, it doesn't intoxicate. You just drink it for the taste of it. And um, the Prophet Sallallahu you know, told us, there's rivers of wine, there's rivers of milk, there's rivers of uh, uh, pure water. The, the soil of Jannah is like white musk. It smells better than perfume. The soil is white. And the, they said, whatever you plant, it grows immediately. So if you want to, if you want to farm, you can have a whole farm like Minecraft. Just throw your seeds, and suddenly you have the whole trees. Um, but yeah, you can have whatever you want. Uh, one time I asked my students, "What do you want in Jannah?" Somebody had this crazy idea. They said, "I want a bucket of popcorn that is endless, so there's no bottom to the popcorn." They said, "I want a huge 3D movie theater." And I want Allah to show me the creation from beginning to end. You can, you, you can do that. You can have a live movie theater. So yeah, the wine of Jannah is not haram, Khalid. It's uh, something to look forward to, actually. The drinks of Jannah. There's a few different drinks Allah talks about in the Quran. Um, there's a drink called Salsabila in Surah Al-Insan. Allah talks about it. Uh, and Allah says it's served in crystal uh, goblets. And another drink called Kafura, uh, it's, a, it's a spring from which the people that are brought closest, they drink. And of course, there's Kawthar. Kawthar is the, is the, the pool given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So. Any other questions? You're muted. Yeah, um, I was just wondering how many uh, prophets has Allah SWT actually directly spoken to? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so a person becomes a prophet when they receive a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked how many mess how many prophets? And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 124,000 prophets. So 124,000 prophets are human beings that actually had contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through angels or through other means. And Musa alayhi salam has been, um, you know, his story is unique in the Quran where he directly spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through a medium, of course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke through his creation to Musa alayhi salam. And you know the story of the, the burning bush um, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduced himself to Musa alayhi salam and said, Inna ni an Allahu la ilaha illa ana. And uh, that's why he got the title Kalimullah, the one to whom Allah spoke. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi sallam, he also experienced, you know, direct communication with Allah at the, at the higher levels. Like he went to Isra al-Mi'raj and he was brought so close, you know, and he spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that, in that meeting. But in terms of, do we know any other prophets spoke to Allah directly? Uh, in reality, every single creation of Allah is actually in an intimate gathering with Allah. Every atom is speaking with Allah and Allah is speaking to it. Like, for example, you are here right now because Allah is telling you be. Okay, so you exist. Right? And, and Allah is telling you be Muslim. So you're a Muslim. And Allah is telling you be, be, be handsome. So you're handsome. So in every quality that you have is actually, it's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, of course, uh, the Quran talks about how everything has its tasbih, how everything is glorifying Allah, everything is like making a dhikr of Allah, even though you're not able to know it's a dhikr, right? If you look at a piece of stone, that stone is doing something. It's in a, in a state of witnessing uh, some aspect of Allah's reality and glorifying it. So there is a communication happening between the stone and its creator, but we don't see it, right? Because to us, it's just a rock. To us, it's just an ant. It's it's just a bee. But at a, at, a, at a deeper level, there is a communication that's happening. So if you're asking about how many prophets talk to Allah directly, like with, with communication as words, Allah knows. Uh, but we have Musa alayhi salam, we have Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how he called out to Ibrahim alayhi salam, wa ayya Ibrahim. Right? We called out to Ibrahim and said, Oh Ibrahim, Allah called him by name. Oh Ya Zakaria, O oh, Zakaria, inna nubashiruka du ghulamin ismu Yahya. So there are prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called out to with their names, and we have some of those stories in the Quran. But if you look at a deeper aspect of reality, 
Every atom in your body is talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're in Allah's presence, alhamdulillah. So somebody asked, who put the Quran in the order it is today? The order of the Quran was uh, by revelation. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has, he received the Quran in what's called Asbab al nuzul uh, throughout his life in 23 years. And the Quran came down in different portions in different uh, sections. And sometimes you would have a Quran that is, for example, from the end of the Quran, Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, right? This is, this is the 19th surah from the end of the Quran. So uh, surah alaq, surah number 96. But it was revealed first in the order of revelation. But as the Prophet Sallallahu received the revelation, Jibreel Alayhi Salam would tell him, put this ayah in this surah, put this ayah in this surah, this one comes after this, this one comes after that. So the order of the Quran is also by divine revelation. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave it to us and taught it to us as he received it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, somebody asked about Dhul Qarnayn, travel through time to different dimensions. I don't know. Did Dhul Qarnayn travel through time to different dimensions? So the story of Dhul Qarnayn is interesting, right? Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was asked by the Jews, tell us about Dhul Qarnayn and his two journeys. And they were very clever. They wanted to know about the, the Ya'juj and Ma'juj. But the Ya'juj and Ma'juj doesn't come up until Dhul Qarnayn's third journey. So Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala tells us about his two journeys to, to the east and to the west. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala marks it by the movement of the sun. So he traveled, Allah gave him all the means. He was this powerful king. He had this army. And he was basically conquering land after land. And he came all the way until the rising of the sun. So, so he, he arrived to the to, to furthest land where the sun is rising. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him he had the power to do whatever. So Allah tells him, if you want, be kind to the people. If you want, punish them. And he says, those that are good, I'll be kind to them. Those that are bad, I'm going to punish them. And when I'm done with them, then you're going to punish them. Right? So he, his power was aligned with the divine power. So he was kind to the righteous and he was actually like harsh on the criminals. And then he comes to a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the sun, it doesn't set. So the people that live there, they don't have a uh, uh, covering from the sun. And some of the scholars, they said, what's interesting about this is Allah didn't say Maghrib al-Shams. He said the sun, it, they have no cover from it. So if you go like really up north, you find that the sun stays around the horizon, you know, uh, for like six months. So some of the scholars, they take that to mean that, you know, Dhul Qarnayn was traveling way up north somewhere, maybe into the, to the upper levels of Europe or something. And that's where he met this people who didn't speak any language. Now, as far as traveling through dimensions and different times, there is some speculations that's been made because of his name. His name, Dhul Qarnayn. Qarn means 100 years. So Dhul Qarnayn is the one who is owner of two, two ages or two epochs. So some people believe that he lived in two different times. And, uh, you know, and, and they, they come up with things, Allahu Adam. There, there's no evidence for it. But uh, definitely this story of Dhul Qarnayn and Ashab al Kaf, there's a lot of mysteries in it. There's a lot of mysteries in it, especially Ajuj and Majuj being signs of the end of time. Some people believe that the influence of Dhul Qarnayn happened in that time and in the future. But what, what I find amazing about Surah Al-Kaf is the entire story is about Rahmah. It's about Allah's mercy. Because when you find that a person is seeking religious knowledge, right? You want to find the knowledge. You want to find guidance. You want to be on the straight path. But the story of Surah Al-Kaf says, no, the people of the cave they ask Allah for mercy. And then they ask Allah for guidance. And then when Musa alayhi salam was out looking for guidance and knowledge, he found the person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we gave him mercy. And then we gave him knowledge. Right? So Musa alayhi salam then, he can't understand what's happening because he's judging based on knowledge. But Khidr was doing things based on what Allah was showing him from his mercy. So at the end he says, this is mercy from your Lord and I didn't do it on my own accord and Dhul Qarnayn says the same thing when he builds the wall he says 
This is mercy from Allah. Then when the promise of Allah comes, then he will take it down. So I, I don't know much about, I mean, I, I never met him, but inshallah we will meet him. And we can ask him in Jannah. Allah talked about you in the Quran. Tell us what you did. And he can tell us inshallah. Um, is it okay to watch animation related to Islam? For example, we recently watched Bilal, the new breed hero. Is that okay? To, it's okay to watch. It's nothing wrong with that. Um, one of the things that we have to understand is that storytelling, right? Storytelling has a deep impact on our on our hearts, on our psyche. And uh, the Quran is actually two thirds of it is stories of the prophets of the nations that went before us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us through telling stories. If the story is good, if it's beneficial, if it's something that's going to help you and, and, and deepen your understanding, then there is nothing wrong with engaging with those with those stories. And of course, in our day and age, stories are taken on the form of animated cartoons and all these other things, right? But if if the story is questionable in its message, then 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 we have to be careful, you know. So so if, if it's something beneficial, no problem, inshallah. Uh, it's it's like a tool. You have a knife, you can cut your your food with it, or you can kill somebody with it, right? Storytelling is the same. It's it's it can it can deliver powerful messages and deeply ingrain them in our hearts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, نَحْنُ نَقُصُ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ We will tell you the best of stories. Right? So even Allah is teaching us through stories. And uh, shayateen also use stories. Right? If you look at all, the, all the, 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 the filthy media, they're also using stories to, to deliver their propaganda and to confuse people. So just be careful with what you watch. As long as it's good, it's okay. Alhamdulillah. Any other questions? Okay, um, I think that'll be it for this halakha. So thank you so much, um, Brother Shoaib. Uh, just one last closing thing was um, when you were talking about like um, hardships and all that, uh, I think it's important that we remember um, to think of Allah in a good way because um, what I heard was that Allah said, um, I am or he is as his servant thinks of him. So when you're in a hardship, it's always good to remember and think of Allah as the most merciful, the most forgiving, and that's how he'll surely um, come to us as. So um, Jazakallah, Brother Shoaib, Jazakallah everyone for coming, and we'll see you uh, next Saturday, inshallah. So, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.